Hey CW Apes, this is Mr. Kennedy here again, and um, this is the second part of your Chapter 6 lecture notes on living things and ecosystems. Today we're going to basically dive into the world of ecological niches and kind of look at how all that fits together in a biological community. So we're going to start off with the idea of a habitat. A habitat is the place or set of environmental conditions in which a particular organism lives. I want you to think about a habitat like your home. So the cool thing about your home is that, well, um, you can share it with more than one species and still live in harmony. You can also change your habitat if you get fed up with it and it's not a big deal. The opposite is true of an ecological niche. Your niche is your role within your habitat or biological community and let's just be frank, um, you can't have two species share the same niche without a fight, right? There are some slight, well, possible exceptions to the rule which we'll get to as we go, but that's kind of the general rule. Think of it this way, if I went to your house, you have a role as like a son or a daughter in your home and your parent or guardian has a role as your parent or guardian. If, you, if they told you to like take out the trash, like that's your job as the kid, go take out the trash. Can you imagine what would happen if you tried to take authority from your parents and they said, go take out the trash and you looked at them and said, no, you take out the trash. There would be a fight, right? Not good. So that's how an ecological niche plays out even in nature. Two species cannot occupy the same niche without a fight under you know almost all conditions. Now when you think about ecological niche um, in kind of a general way, there's two broad categories of niches out there. You can be a generalist or a specialist. If you're a generalist, you have a broad niche and you can kind of make a living in a lot of different ways like, you know, brown rats. Like you don't really care what you eat as long as it's not like crawling away from you and you can catch it, like it's all good. Um, if you're a specialist, you have a very narrow niche like the giant panda. Like, dude, you have to have bamboo and if there's no bamboo, well, you're just gonna turn your nose up to whatever else is, you know, offered up to you. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, that might have a direct impact on your survival. So when you think about ecological niche, okay, remember, right, your niche is an organism's role or job in an ecosystem. Now, aside from being generalist or specialist, there's also uh, your fundamental niche and your realized niche to consider. Your fundamental niche is basically the full potential that could be theoretically achieved by you know, your species or your population, while your realized niche is actually what you're doing, okay? So it's kind of like saying every human, like, you know, you have the potential to be anything you want right now as a high school student. Well, your realized niche that's kind of like just what you're doing. Like maybe I have the potential to be a doctor, but I'm a teacher. So my fundamental niche would be medicine, but my realized niche would be I'm a teacher, right? Same thing plays out in nature. And again, as organisms interact with other organisms within the biological community, um, all those things we talked about in part one of our lecture are gonna come into play. The competition thing, the limiting resources, right, all have an impact on, well, what this population does, where it lives, and ultimately what its role is over time, okay? So um, this is just a quick picture of generalists and specialists just to give you some examples. And, um, you know, if you think about what generalists are, here's a raccoon, the brown rat, and maybe the cockroach that are really good examples of those. And a specialist would be something like the koala bear, the panda, and the anteater. Now, individuals or populations of individuals within an ecosystem vary, I suppose I should say, in their importance. Okay? Some individuals are so important to the ecosystem that we refer to them as a keystone species. Now, a keystone species basically is an individual who may not always be the most abundant, but is always the most important. So if I like wiped out that keystone species, like the entire rest of the ecosystem would collapse. In this picture that you can see here, there's krill right here in the middle of the screen. And you can see all these lines that are attached to the krill. So the idea is, is like, hey, if I, I don't know, if I get rid of squid, like the rest of the ecosystem, this food web 
would probably survive even if there were no squid because, you know, the whales could probably go feed on something else and still be okay. But if I got rid of the krill here in the middle, like that's a keystone species. The entire rest of the ecosystem would collapse without it. So remember, okay, um, keystone species play a critical role in the biological community. And it's usually, you know, proportional to its abundance, but um, not always. So you can have very few individuals play a very important role. I'm stressing this because maybe one day you'll be asked an essay on a question on a test that says like, hey, how do we like save this community? And you're going to want to say, oh, just tell people to leave. No, you got to protect the keystone species. Like that's how you do it. Protect the keystone species and then go out from there. Okay. This is an example or a list, uh, if you will, of lots of different keystone species. Um, it's not an exhaustive list. Just, you know, here's you know, just a couple of quick things. Okay. But as we go community by community, you should be able to pick out the keystone species and be able to explain what's going to happen if they're removed. All right. Next thing we got to look at is uh, predation. So we talked about predation, disease, and all of that in the first part of this uh, lecture when we were looking at evolution and its impact on the population over time. So there's a few things about predator-prey relationships that I want to expand on in this lecture. So obviously a predator is anything that, you know, attacks and eats prey. Um, you know, but if you're a true predator, you don't live in or on that prey item. Um, if you did, then you'd be a parasite. Here's a few things that you got to have to be considered a good predator. Some structural like advantages like natural weapons, fangs, claws, flexible bodies, stuff like that. Um, maybe you're good at stalking your, vi your, your victims. You have big mouth, right? All that. You can, you're fast. Like those are all characteristics of a good predator. This is kind of like, I don't know, a war game, if you will. Um, if you're prey, you've got to you've got to have countermeasures for all of the predators like strategies for eating you. So prey items will probably be really fast. Um, they'll have some way to fight back, maybe stab or poison a predator. They might have hard body coverings like and when it comes to, you know, uh, natural selection, it kind of works, you know, in both avenues, predator and prey. Uh, if you don't have advantageous adaptations, you're going to be taken out. Um, so over time, predators evolve and adapt to kind of like work against prey strategies so that they can continue to feed and be successful. And at the same time, prey work against predators to evolve and adapt so that they don't get eaten. Okay. A good example of how this changes individuals over time is is in the form of mimicry okay mimicry occurs where i i guess the easiest way to put it is you have individuals in a population that just so happen to be born with like that lucky birthmark we talked about in the previous lecture um a, a characteristic or a trait in this case that makes something that could be a a good meal for a predator actually look like a predator or something that is poisonous or toxic or scary to the predator in some way so the predator leaves it alone right so we've got a couple examples here of where like the scarlet king snake you know looks like a coral snake and i know what you're going to say you're going to look at that and you go well not not exactly okay well um you know predators aren't smart like people so they don't know that whole red on black friend of jack red on yellow kill a fellow like saying so they just see the red black yellow stripey bands and they go ooh i better not eat that right so um that's an example of kind of this arms race between predator and prey um, another example of this arms race between predator and prey is in this graphic with the um lynx and the hare so as predator prey interact again what you need to remember is that, yeah, it's a feeding relationship and you can't have tons of predators and very, very small prey populations. And you shouldn't have the opposite either if you want to maintain a healthy ecosystem. Having too many prey items with no predators to keep them in check could actually cause the whole ecosystem to collapse. 
What this graph represents is the delay in reproduction between predators and prey. So as the prey population goes down, well, the predator population at that point is probably high, and that's what's driving the prey population down. So as the prey disappear and you've got lots of predators running around, well, the sad story is the predators are going to start to go hungry and die, leave, right? Maybe they adapt to eating something else. You remember the big three? There's a slide on it here in a minute uh, to remind you. And so as they leave the rabbits alone, uh, because there's fewer predators or less predation, then the rabbit population rebounds. As the rabbit population goes up, then the the predator population responds through reproduction of its own okay so that's just how they kind of get a natural oscillation okay also remember that um, species interaction competition intra and interspecific species interaction can also play out in establishing an ecological niche okay um, intra specific competition remember is the competition uh, between individuals of the same species and then the interspecific competition is competition between members of different species and that can establish what niche I'm going to be in if I were going to have to like partition resources like all that kind of stuff like that um, as well it can establish my role in the ecosystem um, if I'm not good at fighting for resources, then I'm going to have to find other resources to use. Or maybe I just have to defend my resources because I am really good at fighting for my resources. Here's the facts and figures on predation. Okay, Predation, again, is any organism that feeds directly on another, right? Um, without, like, you know, living in or on it. Because if you live in or on it, then you would be a parasite. Okay? And, um, Predator mediated competition is this stuff that, you know, like I was saying, those natural ebbs and flows between predator and prey. Um, basically, one species may be the best competitor in a given location, um, but predators can reduce its abundance and allow a weaker competitor um, to increase in its numbers. And that changes the whole ecological like structure of the area and restructures everybody's um, niche. So that's why it's really, really important. Um, remember, it's an arms race between predator and prey. So predators are going to evolve things that basically make them better at catching stuff, and prey are going to evolve things that basically make them, well, less attractive to the predator or harder to catch. Okay? There are a couple of types of, um, you know, well, a couple new terms and types of prey evolution that um, are on this slide that I want to mention and the idea of co-evolution that I also want to mention. So co-evolution occurs where prey and predator evolve in response to one another. Okay, So that's co-evolution. Um, so one evolves in response to the other. If a predator is evolving better eyesight, then the prey is going to evolve better camouflage. Okay. Um, in terms of the mimicry stuff that I threw out a little while ago, there's two terms that I want you to know, Batesian mimicry and Mullerian mimicry. If it's Batesian mimicry, then you're going to get a harmless species that mimics the warning coloration of a harmful one, like the coral snake um, and that uh, milk snake or the mountain uh, king snake that I showed you. And if you have two harmful species that actually evolve to look alike, that's Mullerian mimicry. So here's an example of Batesian. And in Batesian, you've got like a harmless like beetle that has like evolved to look like a wasp so that like, you know, birds will leave it alone. All right, that brings us to symbiosis. Symbiosis is the, um, you know, well, long term, like close interaction between two separate species so there's three types of symbiotic relationships and you can kind of tell what's going on in each of these mutualism commensalism and parasitism mutualism is where both parties benefit everybody is happy 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 okay um, in commensalism um, basically one party benefits and the other one like it just doesn't care if you're there or not and in par parasitism, one benefits at like the expense of another. Okay. Sometimes people like to say, you know, they have a symbiotic relationship with their best friend or something. Like you can't do that. To have a symbiotic relationship, you have to have a close 
permanent association with a member of the a different species. Here it is in text, okay? So two or more species that live intimately together with their fates linked. And then the verbiage for each of those like pictures that I showed you before. Mutualism, both parties benefit. Commensalism, one benefits, the other one really doesn't care. And then par parasitism, where one benefits at the expense of another. Okay, now the the interactions of these species in a symbiotic way um, can also lead to competitive uh, exclusion. If two species with similar requirements, like you know, try to occupy the same niche, doesn't matter if we're looking at like that symbiotic relationship or not. Um, there's gonna be there's gonna be a fight, and only one species, right, um, will end up being successful in that place. Um, so that we've talked about lots of different examples. This is an example using paramecia. Um, so paramecia in a mixed culture, you can see here that if I put two species in, um, you know, a mixed culture, that basically um, the paramecia aurelia is the only one that's going to be successful because it's fighting for the same resources as paramecium caudata. Okay, so if they start fighting for resources, remember the big three. You can leave, you can die, or you can adapt, and that's going to determine your ecosystem structure based on this competitive um, exclusion and what niche you're going to subsequently be left in. All right, so this is Gauss's law, his proposed idea or the principle of competitive exclusion, where again, basically your ecological niche is defined by the competition between species um, fighting for resources at that same ecological level. And at the end of the day, like, may the best paramecium win, okay? Now, the only plausible solve for Gauss's um, scenario here that, um, you know, he laid out is resource partitioning. It is possible to have individuals use the same niche if they partition those resources like this. So here we have several different birds kind of feeding on the same tree, but they're feeding at different levels. You could also do things where like one species is like active in the daytime and one species is active at night. And that way you could kind of coexist in the same niche and reduce the amount of competition that um, exists between the individuals in those populations. Um, so that brings us to community properties. So in a past lecture, I talked a lot about primary productivity. Energy in the community is super, super important. Remember, primary productivity is the rate of biomass production and it's, you know, basically used as an indication of how much solar energy is going to be converted to chemical energy okay and after the plant plant relative that uh, is doing that uses what it needs for respiration what we're going to be left with is the net primary productivity for the rest of the ecosystem to use and if you remember i showed you this like you know estuaries tropical rainforests have high net primary productivity and someplace like the desert has low primary productivity. This is really important, um, a really important factor in determining your community structure. Like all this competition stuff, natural selection stuff, um, ultimately can be trumped by whatever energy is available in the ecosystem to support life. So if you don't have plants and high primary productivity, like I, everything else in the ecosystem is gonna suffer. So that's where abundance and diversity comes into play. The abundance is the total number of organisms in the community. So as your primary productivity goes down, so too should your abundance. As your primary productivity goes down, so too should your diversity, right? The number of different species. There's kind of an interesting relationship between abundance and diversity. You could actually have a high abundance and low diversity um, and vice versa, right? It just depends on the ecosystem that we're in, okay? Um, as a general rule, diversity decreases um, and abundance within species increases when we move from the equator towards the pole. All right, um, that ecological structure um, related to energy is what we're gonna what we're gonna finish with today. Okay, that and succession. So um, with t regard to energy and primary productivity. 
Um, and there's three basic ecological structures or distributions that I want you to be familiar with. You can have a random distribution, um, a clustered or clumped distribution, or a uniform distribution of individuals within an ecosystem. Uh, really, what you persist in is 110% based on like what kind of resources you have available to you. If resources are plentiful, then it really doesn't matter where you live, you'll have plenty of energy, plenty of access to resources that you need in order to survive, um, not a big deal, right? If, however, resources become limited, predation, all that kind of stuff, disease start to kick in, then like populations are going to start to cluster or clump around what resources are available to them. Um, so that's the second scenario. Um, in uniform distributions, well, we usually see a uniform distribution in a man-made setting or in a setting where individuals are highly territorial and they're defending their, you know, their space from others. Um, distributions can also be vertical as well as horizontal so we can distribute individuals basically from the ground floor of a forest up to the canopy or laterally across space this is what each of those things look like the uniform like you know random and clumped distributions that we see all right complexity and connectedness so within an ecosystem um, as we measure like abundance and diversity we also have to deal with the complexity of the trophic levels in the ecosystem and um, i'm just going to put it out there in a real simple form and tell you this the higher the complexity the more resilient the ecosystem will be to any kind of disturbance that might come its way so what we really want to foster in ecosystem like you know studies is diversity not just I want a whole bunch of one type of creature, but I want lots and lots and lots of variety. Diverse communities um, don't have to necessarily be like super complex, but like when you have diversity, you have resiliency against any kind of disruption, whether it be human or otherwise. Okay, so um, diversity leads to resiliency and stability. That's key. Um, an ecosystem will show constancy if it is diverse and you'll see kind of a lack of fluctuation in composition or function in the ecosystem because ecosystems kind of like you know the basic law of inertia tend to resist change once they have reached that high level of diversity and stability if there were a disturbance a like diverse ecosystem could renew itself fairly quickly and repair that damage. So that's why we like to see lots of diversity and not just really, really high abundance, okay? Um, so the last thing that I'm gonna throw your way is this idea of succession. We've already talked about ecotones here, so I'm gonna skip over that. And uh, we're gonna deal with this concept of succession to bring this to a close. So succession is all about the development of an ecosystem, and it comes in two really like general forms, primary and, success and secondary. Um, primary succession is where a community begins to develop on a site previously unoccupied by life. So the stepwise movement of life into an area that never had life. So all these things we've been talking about are gonna start playing out basically from the ground level um, in primary succession, like we literally have to make dirt first. Um, so like rock has to be broken down into like smaller like pebbles and then like things like lichen and other pioneer species move in. We get all that natural selection, all of the organisms responding to their limiting factors, their range of tolerance, the competition that we talked about. And um, that's gonna determine who ultimately ends up living there and changing that community over time until it eventually reaches a climax community, like a stable, long lasting, healthy community. Secondary succession is, well, very similar, but in this case, um, the community was already there, it was disrupted, and, uh, you know, it's got to recover, like forest fires, landslides, maybe, a, you know, some sort of, like, farm that, like, a human used to run, and then now, like, has been left fallow, and it's going back to, like, being a grassland, right? So, these are the types of ecological succession that you need to be familiar with and just to show you a couple of quick pictures right this is primary succession going from rock to climax community okay 
um, where we have pioneer species that move in first and then like I said all that other stuff happens and eventually we get a large stable diverse uh, community that can persist for generations and um, lastly this is secondary succession so there was a community there it was disrupted and it has to transition back into a healthy community main difference is that we don't have to build soil here first all right gang i'm mr kennedy that's part two of your chapter six lecture notes i'm signing off have a great day